Yes, it's time for reference and bias. So let's dive in. The goal of today is to understand why we need reference circuits, so voltage reference, and bias, current bias circuits. And I want to introduce a few of the circuit architectures that are commonly used in, well, most integrated circuits. There's, a, I think there's quite few actually integrated circuits that don't have some sort of bias or voltage reference inside. So it's, it's important to understand why, I think. I find it's easier to learn something if I understand why it's necessary and why it actually is important. So when we operate in SPICE, then we can easily insert voltage sources and we can insert cur current sources. But in the real world, there is nothing that comes close to resembling a real voltage source or a real current source. The world doesn't work like that. If you're using a voltage source or a current source in your schematic, at some point that has to turn into a cir circuit. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Now let's say that we somehow were able <laughs> to make a voltage source internally on the chip. So that's the VR here. And we make it on one side of the chip and then we want to distribute that voltage to the other side of the chip because maybe we have a analog to digital converter that we want to use that voltage reference to sort of set how large our maximum scale is. Now, here we have to remember the fact that voltages are always a differential between two places. It's, it's a difference in charge density or a difference in, in Fermi potential on, between two places on, on a wire, on a chip, or on anything. So even though at the source side I may have a VR, a voltage source here, that is exact, then if I just have one single line going across the chip with some sort of impedance, these boxes are impedances, and at the destination side, how do I actually ensure that the voltage that I receive is exactly the same as I transmitted? This is a very common problem on a integrated circuit. And the main issue is we can't necessarily guarantee that the ground, sort of, sort of final, final resting place of electrons, we can't guarantee that is exactly the same. So for example, it could be that we do a good job of making sure that the voltage that goes across here, it, it, it comes to the plus, or let me say it differently, there is no current flowing in this wire eventually. So we know that the, the Fermi level at the destination is the same as the Fermi level at the source. However, however, it could be that the Fermi level at minus here is not the same as the minus on the source because that depends on what the current through the ground impedance is. Another trick is that if on the way from the source to the destination we have a capacitance to maybe power or maybe ground and we have noise, then it's quite easy for noise to couple on to our voltage. And if the noise couples onto the voltage, then we may have a problem. So, if we actually want to distribute a voltage across a chip, it is not easy. So, quite often, instead of distributing voltage, we distribute current. Because we can take the voltage, the sort of fixed point in a fixed point that we have in voltage or energy difference, whatever you want to call it. We can divide that by resistor and we can make it current. Now if we distribute the current around and we ensure that there's no DC current flowing in the wire, 
Then at the destination side, if I take an equivalent resistor and place between the two nodes here, I can actually know that the current, the current in this loop, that is gonna be constant. So going from ground, or not going from ground, but from going from my current source through the wire, through the resistor, and to ground. And in that case, I can actually know what the voltage is locally because it's determined by the current. So we always have a choice when we want to distribute a known quantity, be it current or voltage, whether we want to do it in voltage domain or current domain. It turns out that one of the challenges with the strategy I'm showing you right now is that the resistor that might be on the other side of the chip, it will not match exactly to the resistor I have in my source. That's simply due to process variation. The thickness of the polysilicon might be slightly higher and thus the resistance is slightly lower. Or the temperature might be different. That means that usually I can get within a few percent, uh, so a few percent variation between, uh, or resistor variation from one side of the chip to the other side of the chip. But if I actually need something that is extremely accurate, the only choice I have is to actually distribute the voltage. But in that case, we're back to the problem of the ground might not be the same. So if you actually need a ultra precise voltage reference and you need it <laughs> for maybe two IPs, one ADC and one battery charger on your chip, maybe you actually have to put in two accurate voltage references. And that happens. So first topic of today is the band gap voltage reference. How do we create a fixed voltage? And most importantly, when it comes to fixed is we, we speak about uh, quite often, uh, it's abbreviated PVT or process voltage temperature. And that sort of encompasses all the, the types of variation that we usually have on our integrated circuits. So process variation, that's just uh, how the different dyes, how the different transistors changes as a function of which wafer they're sitting on or which day the transistor was made on. And that also encompasses mismatch. Process variation is actually something that we can calibrate for. Because in production of every single chip, we will test it. And if we can test it, quite often we can trim it. So we can sort of take away the process variation. It's not always something that we want to do because it costs extra circuits. It might be hard to do exactly. It might be hard to measure the quantity and so on. It might be more expensive because it requires silicon area or test time, but it's possible. Now the voltage variation, to some extent that is possible. If you have a fixed point in space, you can actually generate voltages that are relatively precise. Sort of plus minus 10 is very easy. Plus minus five, slightly harder. Plus minus one, very tricky percent. But temperature variation. Temperature will vary on our chips. When I go outside with my wristband, my little whoop thingy, uh, well, normally I guess it's gonna be body temperature. But you kind of want it to work even though it was minus 40. And quite often circuits will be designed to tolerate a quite wide temperature range. For example, in the co company I work uh, most of the time, uh, we make circuits and we simulate them minus 40 to plus 125 to be able to, able to tolerate an ambient temperature of minus 40 to 105. But if the temperature varies that much, how do we create a fixed voltage? Well, <coughs> what I talked about in the diode uh, video and lecture, we know that the diode voltage, in this case, I've just shown it as a bipolar diode connected transistor. If we set up the current or set up the equation for the current in the uh, diode connected bipolar, it will look something like this. You have the scale current, you have the exponential of VB divided by VT. So we are where VT is the thermal voltage minus one plus the base current. Now, if we assume that the base current's pretty low, the minus one here is uh, quite irrelevant because the exponential here is much larger than than one, we can simplify it. And we can rearrange it and we can get that the 
voltage across the bipolar is given by the terminal voltage times an logarithm of the collector current divided by the scale current. And the scale current you can find in the book, book is derived here, and if you want to know how it is actually derived, you have to go to the diode lecture, where I try to explain where this Ni comes from. But just to recap slightly how that works, um, you can actually, I, I find it hard to see from this equation which way the <laughs> diode current, act, oh, sorry, the diode voltage or the VBE voltage, the base emitter voltage, which way that goes as a function of temperature, because it kind of looks like it's proportional to temperature, but it isn't, because the scale current increases much faster over temperature than um, the uh, T here. So in order to see that, you can rearrange it, and this takes a bit of time. You have to find the original equations for the intrinsic carrier concentration, the Ni squared. But in the end, you will see that the VBE is equal to some sort of uh, thermal voltage and a difference between a, I just call it L. In this case, the L is a, it's not a constant, but is a parameter that is temperature independent or roughly temperature independent, minus 3 T, uh, 3 ln T. And here is where the negative temperature coefficient of diode voltages comes in. But we can see that if we insert zero for the temperature, so absolute zero, we actually get the bang gap voltage. And the L, that's given by the down here, just quickly go through maybe. So the logarithm of the collector current, the logarithm of the unit charge times the area of the diode, and then we have the logarithm of, and here, it's not really apparent, but the Ni, the intrinsic carrier concentration, that I pulled out, and what we're left with here is really something that represents the diffusion of electrons in the p-substrate. So this is the diffusion constant, constant for electrons divided by the diffusion length of electrons. So how far uh, the electrons travel in the p-type material before they recombine, and the same for holes in the n-type material. Then a constant, and the rest of the stuff here, that, act, that actually comes from the intrinsic carry concentration, where we have the effective mass of the electrons, effective mass of the holes, and a constant. If you plot it, then you get it a negative temperature coefficient. So diode voltage and base emitter voltage, and for that matter, the uh, VGS of a MOSFET has a negative temperature coefficient. It goes down as a function of temperature. Now, how can we use that fact? Well, if we have <laughs> something that decreases with temperature, and we could combine it somehow with something that increases with temperature, maybe we can get some uh, quantity that is flat over temperature. And that's sort of the principle of pretty much all band gap circuits. And the circuit that you're looking at right now, that is one of the methods that we generate a current that is proportional to absolute temperature. So, quick run through. We know that VD1, which is the diode voltage, that decreases with temperature. And what we do with the op amp here is actually ensure that the VR voltage on top of the resistor is the same as the diode voltage. And the reason we do that is, turns out that if we scale the area of the diode, so we have a larger diode, we can generate a diode voltage here, VD2, that is lower. So if we look at the equation up here, we can see if we take the difference between the diode voltage on VD1 minus VD2, that's going to be given by the thermal voltage, the LN divided by the current in the, uh, diode 1 over the scale current minus VD, the uh, thermal voltage, LN, the current in, or current in diode 2, 
uh, divided by the scale current. And maybe here I should have actually written it slightly differently. I see now. There's a mistake here. So what's actually different between the two cases uh, is the scale current. Let's fix that. <laughs> right, so now I think I fixed the equation. So what we can see from the figure is that the current in the two diodes, that's the same. But the scale current, that's going to be different between the two diodes because they have a different area. So IS2 is going to be larger than IS1, which means that it's given by the size difference. So if I just quickly go back through the uh, diode equation, we can see that in the scale current, we have the area of the diode. And that's why we end up with a difference in voltage here that is given by the thermal voltage times the logarithm of the size difference. The size difference it could doesn't have to be just the size area difference between the two diodes. It could also be that there is a current difference. It, it, it is uh, equivalent. Okay. So that delta V is going to be across the R1. And it might not be easy to see it, or you might not have an intuitive understanding for why it is the case. But the current, the ID, will actually be determined by the delta, VB, delta VD here, the VTD, VTLNN, divided by R1. And that's going to be the ID. The reason for that is if you design the op amp correctly and you stabilize the loop and you do everything correctly, the point of this op amp is to force VD1 equal to, or to, to force the VR equal to VD1. And it will tune the current up and down until that happens. Now, that means that the current must stabilize at the point where we have VD1 at the top of the resistor and VD2 at the bottom of the resistor. And thus, the current must be equal to delta VB or delta VD, <laughs> this VT uh, LNN, divided by R1. So now we have a current that is proportional to temperature. And what we need to do now is figure out how do we combine the negative temperature coefficient of the diode voltage with a positive temp coefficient, temperature coefficient. And there are many, many different ways. I'll run through a few examples. Based on the circuit that we saw earlier, where we have a current that is proportional to temperature, we can copy that current and we can scale the resistor such that that pretty much exactly compensates for the negative temperature coefficient of VD3. So as VD3 goes down, the current that is proportional, so that goes up, and that makes sure that the voltage across this um, resistor increases with temperature. And if you do the R1s and R2s with the correct sizes, and you have to do this in the spice M later, I know there is equations in the book that you can get sort of a rough estimate, but in the end you have to do it in the spice simulator. You can get a voltage reference that is around sort of 1.21, well, depending on technology, around 1.2, 2-ish volts. So that's one option. The challenge is the VREF here is going to be 1.2 volts. That's that's sort of the point where the sum of these two work. You can't make it a different voltage. Not really, with this circuit. <clears throat> and that sets limits on how high or how low our VDD can be, because we need some VDS on the transistors in order for them to act like MOSFETs. And what I mean by act like MOSFETs that is that the current through them doesn't really depend that much on the voltage across the transistor. It only depends on the VGS. So another method could be to combine the resistors into the original circuit. So we can see the difference here if we take the R2 and actually include it into the branches, current branches that we already have. 
then we can generate the same type of sum because the VR1 or the voltage here, that's the same as VD1. So we can add a larger resistor and thus get a VD1. VD1 will be decreasing with temperature and the current times the uh, R2, that's going to give us a voltage difference that increases with temperature. And again, we can generate a voltage that is around 1.2 volts, 1.21. Same problem in the circuit that is that the, the voltage at the VDD, that has to be higher maybe than, let's say, 1.4, 1.5 volts. So you need quite high sub, sub voltage in these type of circuits. <clears throat> now, if we go way back in time, <laughs> there was a guy, I actually don't know if he is still around, but there was a guy called uh, Paul Broco. You can find videos on um, videos of him explaining bang gap and bipolars on the net, but he made a bang gap reference. And let's just have a look at that. No, that didn't work. Let's try again. Uh, I think that's okay. Just a second. Right. So this was in 1974, two years before I was born. He worked on band gaps. And he came up with a structure that looks like this. Uh, actually, we can see it here. And that's the same as you find in the book. And is this circuit. So you can go back to his paper and you can read sort of the original derivation of that. But I'd like to go through how this band gap also works. It's a similar principle, but here we use bipolars instead of diodes or yeah, instead of diodes. So first of all, there's a size difference. So here in this case, Q1 is larger than Q2. Now that means that whatever the voltage is on the source here, we will get a delta VBE across R2. So the voltage across R2 in this case is also go gonna be given by the thermal voltage times, times the ln of the size difference. If you work through it, that's actually how it's gonna come out. <clears throat> and then, what the op amp does is ensure that the voltage at the bottom of the resistors here, that is the same. And there's only one point where that can happen. And <clears throat> that means that the current in these two branches is the same because the voltage across the R3 and R4 is the same. And that's where the point, that's the point where you get the delta VBE across R2. Now, since the current in the first branch is the same as the current in the second branch, then we know we have two times the current that is going through R1. And if we look at the voltage at the top of R1, that's going to be a voltage that is proportional to absolute temperature. Because we know that the current is set by delta VBE divided by R2. So two times that current times R1 is going to give us a voltage that is proportional to absolute temperature. And then if we look at the VBG, uh, the band gap output, that is actually a combination of that positive voltage, or the, the voltage that is a PTAT voltage that increases with the absolute temperature, and the, del the, uh, the VBE of the bipolar transistor. Now that's just a diode drop. So that's going to be a voltage that decreases with temperature. And we can, as long as we size it correctly, and there's some formulas for that in the book, you will get a output voltage here too that is proportional, sorry, that is stable across temperature because you're combining a CTAT with a PTAT. The equation for the VBG is given here. We have the bang gap voltage. And then we can recognize we have that KT ln T0 divided by T. And that is the same as we had earlier in this equation, just written slightly differently. So VG plus some sort of factor. And that's the same thing as we see here. 
Now, M is given in the book, but that actually depends on the details of the circuit. So again, it's usually a good idea to simulate. And then we have a part that is um, the combination of the negative temperature coefficient and the positive temperature coefficient. So as long as we make the last factor here, I think that's the factor that we try to make zero, um, then we're good. Now, in the simulator, if you design this, you scale the resistors correctly, then you'll get a curve that is around 1.21-ish. Here it depends a bit on technology, but it's around this voltage. And you can see that the change over temperature is only a few millivolts. So here we are, here we're at uh, 1.207, and we go down to 1.204, so that's about three millivolts. So this is a very stable non-voltage. So uh, three millivolt in this case, what's that? So 1% would be 12 millivolts divided by four, so this is about 0.2% in the typical corner. However, when you simulate the different corners, well, then your diode might not actually, the relationship uh, or the relationship might not be exact anymore. Things will vary with uh, fast MOS and, well, lots of stuff. <laughs> and your temperature coefficient uh, or how this bang gap voltage looks like might actually change a bit. And that's this is also where trimming comes into play, so actually modifying the measuring in production, uh, something about the bang gap, and then trimming something inside. I want to mention that the challenge with bang gaps and trimming is if I wanted to correct the green curve where we can see a sort of a clear slope. In order to know that there was a slope over temperature, I would need to test two different temperatures. Because if I only test one point, I cannot determine what the slope is. In order to figure out what the gain here is, or, or the line here is, I need two points. Which means that I would have to test my every single die I make at two temperatures. And that is actually quite costly. So it's possible to do that on what we call circuit probe, where we go down on the wafers with sort of a probe card. Imagine a bunch of needles going down and testing the chip. In that point, when you're, t when you're testing full wafer, it, it, it's not that expensive to, well, it is expensive, but it's not sort of insanely expensive to test different temperatures because you can heat up the whole wafer at the same time. But testing every single package chip at different temperature is quite expensive, just simply because it is tricky to have a system where you're putting your chip into a socket, heating it up or cooling it down, and you're supposed to do this quickly. Which means, if we can avoid it, we don't want to do multi-temperature calibration. It is a pain. Of course, if you can sell the temperature sensor for an insane amount of money, Maybe it's okay, but if you want to sell things for next to nothing, sort of less than a dollar, you can't really do multiple temperatures. So it's better to do a good design and then take what you get. All of these um, bang up uh, references, they have a challenge, and that is that the maximum VDD has to be above around 1.4, 1.5 something. That's usually not a big challenge because even when we go down to 22 nanometer, we still have IO voltage of about 1.8. So it's quite possible to make bang gaps at those, with those IO transistors. But if you have sort of a pure uh, digital chip with, well, not pure digital, but <laughs> a very low voltage chip, you can't really do uh, a vol low voltage bang gaps with the circuits I've showed you so far. But way back when, a guy called Banba. He made a sub one volt operation CMOS bang gap. Oh, come on. I just signed in. And that's what uh, I'm going to talk about now. Let's see when was this. 
in May 1999, so a long time ago. And here is the circuit. We can see there's a similar stash. We have a diode. Let me make it a big bit bigger. We have a diode. We have a larger diode. We have a resistor. But then there's, there's these additional resistors. And then somehow we mirror the voltage to a voltage ref or to to a fourth. Is it a fourth? Yeah, fourth resistor, and that gives us our voltage reference. Now, something that you can see immediately that in order for V ref here to be constant over temperature, then I three should be almost constant over temperature because the R will have a very small temperature coefficient. So we don't have a necessarily a we don't have a pita current anymore. But let me go through a bit more in detail because it can be a bit confusing if you sort of not used to it. Let's start with the the circuit that we have, where we have the current is a proportional to absolute temperature. Now let's add a for fun of it, add a unity gain buffer. So this is just an op amp that copies our VD1, well, we already copied VD1 from the left side to the right side, and let's copy it again, and let's place that over a resistor. Now, it should be relatively obvious then that the current through R2 here is complementary to absolute temperature because the voltage over R2 will decrease with temperature. Now, what's important to realize is the voltage at the top of R1, or the VD1, the diode voltage, that doesn't change if I remove my op-amp. So I, in the circuit that you see now, the VD1, the diode voltage, that's actually roughly the same. It doesn't change. So the current through the diode doesn't change. What changes is that now I have a CTET current in addition. So since the VD1 decreases with absolute temperature, the current in R2 is a current that goes down as a function of temperature, given by my VBE or my diode voltage divided by R2. The current in the right diode and the left diode, actually, both of those currents will increase with temperature. If it's not obvious, then please ask questions in the lecture, and I'll try to explain it more and clear out any misunderstandings that you might have. But the situation that we have now is that this op-amp configuration will find a point where the current in the PMOS is now a combination of the diode voltage divided by R2 and the delta VD divided by R1. Now, the last factor, delta VD divided by R1, that has a positive temperature coefficient. VD divided by R2, that has a negative temperature coefficient, which means I can make my PMOS current stable over temperature. When I have a stable current over temperature, I can put it into a resistor, and now I can get any voltage I want, because I can just choose what the R is going to be, and that can give me a 0 0.6, or 0 0.5, or 0 0.9, or you can choose whatever. Output voltage. The VDD of the circuit that you're looking at now will depend a bit on what type of structure you're using for the diodes, or the bipolars, and what the, the diode voltage is, so the area of the diodes and so on. But as was shown in Banba's orig original paper, it's possible to go quite low, maybe down to uh, one volt. Let's see here. This is the proposed. So if you wanted to make a band gap for the project, where you're designing a temperature sensor, you if you need a constant voltage, maybe a circuit like this is somewhere to start.
So that's a couple of examples of a band gap voltage, a stable voltage. But quite often, we're not really that worried about getting a stable voltage. All we want is a current to put into our transistors and make them work. <laughs> so <clears throat> if we do have a band gap available, it is very common to actually derive a stable current from that band gap. So let's just, this voltage source that represents my band gap, I can copy that voltage across a resistor and now I have a stable current. Actually, in the um, Banba reference that you see here, I can get a stable current immediately that I can use as a bias current. I could just copy the current running in the resist R3 here another time and I'll get a stable current. So here it is actually a choice of whether what you what do you need the circuit for? Do you want a voltage or do you want a current mirror or do you want bias currents? And that depends, depends on what you're doing on that particular product. But this is a typical voltage to current converter. There's also a bias cell called a GM cell. And what we're trying to do in the GM cell is actually to create a current that is proportional to transconductance. Now, I'm not going to go through the equations here. I would encourage you to do that um, by yourself. Look in the book, figure out how this works. I'll try to explain it a little bit, what each of the circuits do. First of all, let's start at the top. At the top, it is simply a current mirror. It doesn't do anything. It just tries to ensure that the circuit, uh, that <laughs> the currents on the two sides are the same. The second current mirror, that is actually just to copy the voltage on transistor here named one to the transistor four. So it has the same drain voltage. If they have the same drain voltage, then, and they have the same gate voltage, they will have pretty much the same current. And then we have the structure lowest here. So what we want to determine when working out what happens in this circuit is what is the VO here? And the way we can look at that is if the transistor on the left side, the one with four, is actually four times larger, then we'll go up a VGS and we'll go down a VGS. Now, since the transistor is four times larger, the VGS of the second transistor has to be lower. It turns out that if these transistors are biased in strong inversion, if I remember correctly, the voltage that you get across uh, the impedance is going to be proportional to V effective. I think it was half V effective or something like that. Have a look in the book. Well, the impedance here could be a resistor, so I can get a transconductance of my this is usually used for biased op amps and things like that. So if I use this current coming from the GM cell in a amplifier, I can actually get a transconductance that is proportional to resistor. And that's a good thing because my transconductance, that's given by, uh, let's see, mu n c ox uh, w over l times v effective. But since the voltage across my resistor here is actually the effective. It comes straight out from the equations. And my current now is just V effective by, divided by R. It turns out I can get a transconductance that is proportional to this resistor. And then maybe that's useful <laughs> in my amplifier to get a constant transconductance. Where that's usually is quite useful is um, for example, the unity gain frequency of an op-amp with a certain capacitive load. Let me say it's an o OTA, Operational Transconductance Amplifier, and maybe not an op-amp. That's commonly given by the uh, transconductance divided by the load capacitance. And in this case, at least the transconductance would be relatively constant. It would, wouldn't vary widely depending on the mobility, for example, or the threshold voltage for that matter. But it's also cool that you don't have to use a resistor as the impedance. We could also use capacitors. 
Now, this is a concept that I haven't introduced yet, but we'll talk about it in a couple of lectures, and that's this is similar to what we call switch capacitor. And the principle's quite easy. Now, ignore the C0, that's just there to stabilize the voltage. Because if we're looking at the current that goes through the right branch, when phi1 is open, so that means phi1 is low here, then there's no current flowing through this NMOS. At that point, phi2 is on, and it's discharging C1. And then the second phi is when phi1 is on, I charge C1 to V0. So I put a known charge on C0. That charge is given by uh, C, the capacitance, times the voltage. And then we do it again. So in the second phase, we discharge that charge. So for every single period of the clock here, the phi1 clock, I now have an average number of charges <laughs> that I dump the ground. I sort of steal an average chunk of charge. Now that is equivalent to a current. And that means that the resistance, kind of like the resistance of this switch structure, is given by 1 over the capacitance times the frequency. So if the frequency is higher, then more charge is dumped and the current is higher. The reason this type of circuit is quite cool and can be very useful is, as I mentioned, the unit gain frequency of a op-amp system or OTA system with a with a capacitive load is GM time uh, divided by the load capacitance. Now, in this case, I've actually <laughs> coupled my transconductance to capacitance. So my transconductance is proportional to capacitance and my load capacitance is proportional to capacitance. So now I can kind of get a stable unit again frequency if that's what I wanted. And all these type of tricks is what analog designers spend their life on, sort of developing and using. And I would say that through your education now and through the first stage of working, you're sort of building up a tool chest of techniques, tricks. And for every single problem that you attack, you look in your tool chest and you see, oh, what could work here? What's the right way to approach this? What's the right reference to choose? What's the right strategy? What's actually the important thing in my circuit. So that's kind of fun. That's kind of like uh, continuous exploration. Okay, that's what I wanted to touch on today. Have a fantastic day.